Good morning. Welcome, everybody, to Paradise Valley United Methodist Church. Um, and we want to thank Larry for helping out and filling in. You may have noticed that Ashley's not here, and you probably remember that she is actually on the uh, youth music tour. They went to San Diego, and they have had quite an adventure. Um, the van uh, fan belt broke and overheated just west of the dunes. The engine blew, and now one of our vans has been sold for scrap parts at an auto uh, repair shop in Alpine, California. Won't be making the return trip. But they've been able to find uh, a rental van to get them through the rest of the uh, trip, and the kids are in good spirits. In fact, I got a message I, I want to share with you uh, from Ashley. She said, we had an, this was yesterday, we had an amazing performance this morning, some of the best ringing and singing we've done. Audience was grateful. Kids have been absolutely great through everything. No complaining or anything. So there you go. So Paradise Valley United Methodist Church is a church that believes in good news for all. And we are so happy that you're here to worship with us today, whether it's in person or online. Uh, no matter how you got here, where you came from, how you identify yourself, this is a home for you and you belong here. And we're just so happy that you have joined us to experience the presence of God in a family together. We do have a few announcements that we want to uh, share with you, so I'm going to uh, kind of point your attention to the back of the order of service in the bulletin. Uh, the first one, we have a huge event coming on uh, tonight at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. That's the Pride Celebration together, and the wonderful news about that is it is sold out. Um, so all of the registrations have been um, done ahead of time. Now, that doesn't mean that you still can't attend. It just means that there's no seats available. So if you still want to show up tonight, it is free if you don't mind standing. Um, but it looks like it's going to be an amazing uh, event of worship music and Broadway songs and with a lot of talent. I saw the rehearsal the other night, and yeah, it will be something you won't want to miss, uh, certainly. Um, Summer Pickleball starts up this week, Wednesday, uh, 6 to 8 in the Fellowship Hall. Don't forget, if you've got kids or grandkids, we have the Water Games event uh, coming up on Saturday on the 8th from 5 to 8 with a lot of great activity and food and things like that to keep the kids occupied. Uh, the foundation team um, for the Paradise Valley United Methodist Foundation is having a coffee reception to celebrate their Legacy Society members. And that will be next Sunday on the 9th in the church library following the traditional service at 9. And if you have any questions, feel free to talk to Michael or any of the other foundation members. And then again, don't uh, forget, family camp is coming up um, Labor Day weekend. I know it seems like a long ways away because we just got through Memorial Day. However, um, it's good to register and plan ahead for that. And... With all of those things happening in the life of the church, we have much to be thankful for. Now let us take a moment to center our hearts and minds as we enter into worship.
Please stand for the call to worship. We are the body of Christ, baptized in one spirit. We are members of one body, many and varied in gender, color, sexuality, age, class, and ability. We are members of Christ's beautiful body. Say to another, I have no need for you. <clears throat> None of us can say to another, I will not care for you, for we are connected by muscle and bone. One suffers, we all suffer. If one rejoices, we all rejoice. Thanks be to God, who in Christ has made us one. Let's worship God. <laughs> Good morning. For those that don't know me, my name is Dee Dee Arikaketh, and I'm an elder in the United Methodist Church. I work for the conference office, so a lot of times on Sunday morning, I get to be a pew sitter here with you. Uh, with Jonathan on vacation, I get to actually get put to work. So here we are today. We are celebrating at this table the richness of God's love, the forgiveness of our sins, and the new life that Jesus gives us. This table is open to anyone. You do not need to be a member of this Methodist church, any Methodist church. This could be your first time here, or this could be your 10,000th time at a church. This table is open to all who earnestly want to just open their hearts and be renewed and forgiven. So let us celebrate in this holy ritual together. Oh, I got a brand new bottle. Let's see if I can break in. Oh, there, yeah, there we go. No. Technical difficulties, a difficulty I never thought we'd get today. Okay, here we go. Join with me. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and a joyful thing always to worship you. 
With your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread. He gave thanks and broke the bread and gave it to the disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks to God and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my body and blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you can in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry throughout the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at this heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. I'm going to invite those who are helping with communion to come forward. Now, if this is your first time here or you haven't been here in a while, not to worry. We will have ushers that will guide you on how to uh, get out of your pews and get back into them. So just stay, just stay put, I guess, until you're invited. to be sought for the earth. 
Good morning, everybody. Um, at this time, I invite all the kids to join me up front for our children's time. Go, Jude, go. Yes. <laughs> a big crew today. It's awesome to see you all. Did any of you do anything really fun the first week of summer break? Anyone already go on vacation? Yes, yeah. Yes, your sister's on vacation. Yeah. Well, come on in. We want everyone to scooch in, scooch in. We don't have to have such a big circle. All right. So what do, what do I have with me? Legos. Actually, it's in a Lego box, but they're actually duples, so it's a box. That's right. And, but I have Kira here. She's going to help me do something. So when we think about, when we think about church and helping, Mom can stay. Yeah, you can stay. So when we think about church and helping other people and serving other people and loving other people, what are some things that you all think about doing when it comes to serving others? I'm going to have Kira write them down for us on our bricks. What are some ways that we serve others? Can you think of one? Communion. That's true. We do communion together. That's a good one. Yeah. Alexander. You help out. Yep, you can put help. Oh, you help ourselves. Yeah. What else do you guys do to serve others? Yeah, Jacob. Help other people. What do you like to do to help other people? Eat. 
yeah, if they're hurting, you can maybe bring them like a Band-Aid or an ice pack or something like that. So help them if they're hurt. Yeah, just if people are hurt. What are some other things? Can you think of anything else? What are other ways that we help people? No, it can be at school or at home or at your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That's great. You helped feed others at Feed My Starving Children. That's a great thing. What else? Yeah, Lucy. <gasps> Doing chores at your house. That is a doing that that would be my favorite chore at my house if you want to come do it yes doing dishes at home is a good one to help and serve others anything else that you guys can think about that you do Lucy, you have another cleaning your room that's a good one anything else that you guys do what about some things that maybe you do for your teacher at school are there ways that you help serve your teacher at school when it's not summer yeah do your homework on time yeah you don't have homework oh i wish so all of these things by themselves, yeah, that's fine. When we have them here, it's just one thing, right? If we just do one thing. But what's the great thing? What do we do with Legos and Duplos and blocks? You build them. That's right. And with Legos specifically, they connect to one another, don't they? So, yeah, you can, so that we can see all the things that we do together. So, like Jude said, they connect and they can become anything. So what I want you to remember is that when we love and serve others in our community, at church, at school, in our neighborhood, everywhere that we are, we are building community and trust together. And that's something we always want to work towards, that together we're stronger, we're better, and we can become anything. So let's pray together, friends. <laughs> Good morning, Jesus. Thank you for being our guide on how to love others and build strong communities. Amen. All right, and you can head to Sunday school or back with your family. As some children are leaving the building, I am going to invite another special one to come forward. Charlotte, we are baptizing this morning. I'm going to invite Charlotte and maybe her parents, maybe some other folks, whoever Charlotte deems is part of her circle. A few weeks ago, I was up here for a confirmation and one baptism. And I want to just highlight what a joy it is that you all attend a church where there are tons of kids getting confirmed, that there are baptisms happening every few weeks. It really shows the ministry and mission of the church and all that we're doing. I know. Oh. Oh. We've identified who mommy is. And with uh, Charlotte's mom and dad are her godparents. So I'm guessing, yes. Perfect. Let us continue in faith in our celebration of baptism. Is there another slide? There we go. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we become members of the family of God. As we are given new birth through water and the Spirit, all this is God's gift offered to us without price. Through the affirmation of our faith, we come to the waters to renew our commitment to each other's presence, to Christ who has raised us, the Spirit who has birthed us, and to the Creator who is making all things new. This morning, I, I present Charlotte for baptism. On behalf of the whole church, I'm going to ask you, parents, will you turn away from the powers of sin and death? If so, say, I do. I do. Will you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. I do. Will you let the Spirit use you as prophets to the powers that be? Will you accept the freedom and power God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I will. I will. Will you proclaim the good news and live as disciples of Jesus Christ, his body on earth, 
Confess Jesus Christ as your savior and put your whole trust in his grace. <laughs> and promise to serve him as the Lord in union with the church, with Christ who is open to people of all ages, nations, and races. I will. Will you be living witness to the gospel individually and together, wherever you are and in all that you do, we remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world. If so, please say, I will. I will. I will. <laughs> now, questions for you, because baptism is not just about the parents. It's about those who volunteer to teach Sunday school, to help with confirmation retreats, to help grab Charlotte, you know, as she runs into the parking lot. So as a community of church, we are also helping to raise her in faith. So do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? The church is the family of Christ, the community in which we grow in faith and commitment. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and live, and, excuse me, and life, and include this child now before you in your care? All right, if Charlotte is happy, we're gonna leave her where she is. Okay. All right, Charlotte, hi. Water. Agua. Charlotte, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, Mommy. and of the Holy Spirit. Mommy. Oh, the Holy Spirit work within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Mommy. Amen. Mommy. I'm going to invite us to put a hand on Charlotte or a hand near Charlotte who's holding Charlotte. Seems to be a safer bet, yes? Charlotte, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and mark as Christ's own forever. Amen. All right. Members of this household of God, I commend this child to your loving care. Do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, and perfect her in love. As members together. Our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service. Let us welcome Charlotte into our community. Well, good morning. My name is MJ, and uh, I come from the Ignite service. It's so nice to be with you all this morning. Um, I'm actually here to talk about our mission moment. Um, this is, let's see, it's June. It's Pride Month, and we have this incredible outreach um, tonight, as I'm sure you're aware. The organization that we're supporting today is called One in Ten. It is a locally grown 30-year-old organization um, that is doing incredible work specifically to care for and nurture LGBTQ plus youth ages 11 to 24. And um, they focus on four incredible strategies, but overall what they're doing is just being a, a safe place, a nurturing place, a loving place for kids who may not have that at home or at school. 
Um, they have a, a shelter program for homeless kids who've been kicked out of their homes. They have a self-esteem building program that's suicide prevention. They have all kinds of community drop-in centers, and they also have um, a special camp program in the summer called Camp Outdoors. So I really want to take a moment and encourage us as a body to, um, to think about what we might give today. If that's something that you feel led to do, um, you want to go to the Give Now, and you can just demarcate other for Pride event. Thank you. At PVUMC, we take our discipleship seriously. We see our giving as a sign of how we know and trust God. If you attend here regularly, we hope that you make generosity one of your rituals of faith. If you're a visitor, we don't expect you to give, but we hope that you're giving somewhere, as this is an act of faith in caring for our world. One of the reasons I give to this church is that I'm, I'm inspired by its rich history of improving the lives of others. Recently, a few of us worked on a project for the annual conference related to what we're most proud of since our church began in 1960. With help from Martha Rennie, our church archivist who has digitized, digit, I can't say it, digitized and importantly made our archives searchable, we learned that in addition to starting the Open Table, which is now in 36 states, and Audrey's Angels, now in 115 elder care homes, PBUNC started two new churches. In 1988, we sponsored the founding of the Fountains UMC in Fountain Hills. And about a decade later, we started Desert Mission UMC to serve the Cave Creek and Desert Ridge areas. Other things we noted for the conference, our top-rated PVUMC preschool, which was started in 1997, was the very first preschool in the Valley to be accredited. For over 20 years, we've sent medical mission teams to Guatemala. Our youth have participated in local, national, and international missions for years. And in 2016, we developed our bold and diverse inclusivity statement while also hosting the convocation for the first openly gay UMC bishop. We can be proud of how our church has impacted the lives of others. I give so we can continue this tradition. You can give when the ushers pass the plate around or by going online to pvumc.org and pressing the Give Now button. Thank you for your loving care for God's world. at the table for everyone born clean water and bread a shelter a space a safe place for growing for everyone born a star of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. And for old, a place at the table, a voice to be heard, a part in the song, the hands of a child in hands that are wrinkled, for young and for old. to belong and God will delight when we are 
creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice. Justice and joy, joy. For everyone born, a place at the table to live without fear and simply to be to work to speak out to witness and worship for everyone one the right to be free and God will delight when we are creators of justice and Please stand for our scripture reading, which is from 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 13. If I speak in tongues of human beings and of angels, but I don't have love, I'm a clanging gong and a clashing cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and I know all the mysteries and everything else, and if I have such complete faith that I can move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give away everything I have and hand over my own body to feel good about what I've done, but I don't have love, I receive no benefit whatsoever. Love is patient. Love is kind. It isn't jealous. It doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant. It isn't rude. It doesn't seek its own advantage. It isn't irritable. It doesn't keep a record of complaints. It isn't happy with injustice, but it is happy with the truth. Love puts up with all things, trust in all things, hopes for all things, endures all things. Love never fails. As for prophecies, they will be brought to an end. As for tongues, they will stop. As for knowledge, it will be brought to an end. We know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, what is partial will be brought to an end. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, reason like a child, think like a child. But now that I have become a man, I've put an end to my childish things. Now we see a reflection in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know partially but then I will know completely in the same way that I have been completely known. Now faith, hope, and love remain. These three things, and the greatest of these is love. We are grateful for the gift of Scripture.
You may be seated. Well, good morning again, everyone. This is an interesting passage to take a look at because 1 Corinthians 13, which is sometimes called the love chapter, may be one of the most well-known passages in the New Testament and is certainly one of the most commonly referred to biblical passages in all of literature. But sometimes when we hear something so often, we have a tendency to gloss over it and maybe forget what it really means. And even for people who rarely go to church, but who attend weddings, this is a passage that they have undoubtedly heard many times. It is certainly an appropriate passage to be read at weddings, as the instructions about how to love apply to making a life partnership strong and resilient. And in this way, it can also be a message of evangelism, for sharing a teaching about God's way of love with folks outside the church. But again, here is the danger. Perhaps because of its cultural familiarity, it is also easy to ignore and dismiss as just romantic fluff that it's merely a reminder to encourage the new couple getting married to be good to each other as they begin their married life. But it really doesn't go any deeper. Yet in this chapter, what's so interesting is that Paul does not primarily have in mind any romantic yearning or infatuation with a partner or a new spouse. Paul does not write about a love that originates in one person and then reaches out to another. Instead, this love comes from God and claims us and in so doing reaches others through us not simply someone special that we wish to be our spouse. This love can never find its sole purpose in another single individual, but rather through and beyond that other person. And so while it does affirm love between two people and should be read at weddings, it needs to be done so in a way that we can understand that the love between those two persons doesn't start with them, but with God. And that the goal of that love is not simply the couple, but the community that they create through their union. True love for Paul begins with God and always reaches beyond oneself to others. Love never stops with one person, no matter how special they are to us, but extends through the loved one to minister to a broken world in which the new couple make their life together following the example of Jesus. So what Paul is teaching in this chapter is about giving perspective and balance to the matter at hand. And the matter at hand, if you recall, in the previous chapter, chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, is the proper use and understanding of spiritual gifts in the church. Because chapter 13 directly follows 12, in trying to recognize the most appropriate ways to value and employ the gifts of the Spirit 
for furthering God's ministry in the world through the church. And you all may recall as well that in chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about how love builds up. And we saw an echo of that in the children's moment sermon as well. In other words, the key to understanding how spiritual gifts should be used, the principle that grounds spiritual gifts is love. And love for the purpose of edification and building up the common good, not for the purpose of getting attention for oneself or for one's personal gain, which was the practice that was happening to some in the church at Corinth, which was why Paul was having to write to them and warn against this. Paul mentions various spiritual gifts, such as speaking in tongues, prophesy, prophecy, and faith. And he emphasizes that all of these gifts, as powerful as they are, are worthless if they don't have love. If someone speaks eloquently but lacks love, Paul says they are like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So here I have to kind of maybe uh, part ways with Paul just slightly and surmise that perhaps Paul hung out with some rather bad drummers. Because if a cymbal is played well, it's the most beautiful and lovely sound you can imagine. But I could be biased about that. But Paul's point is this. If they possess great knowledge or faith but lack love, they have nothing. For Paul, faith that lacks love is a dangerous form of religious fanaticism. The faith that God helps us to have for a healthy spiritual life is grounded in love first. And any knowledge or intelligence that is disconnected from the ethics and responsibility of love will inevitably become a cold and inhuman tool for control and oppression. This passage highlights the centrality of love as not only the heart of the good news and the substance of the ministry of Jesus, but how love is the ground of being that structures God's relationship to the world. The chapter begins by highlighting the supremacy of love. And if someone possesses remarkable gifts and performs extraordinary acts, without love, those efforts are meaningless. Love is the foundation upon which everything else rests. And more importantly, love is not just a feeling. It's an action. It's about selfless giving, compassion, empathy. Without love, even the most impressive accomplishments are empty and futile. We live in a society where we are taught that our value and worth come from our accomplishments and the resources that those accomplishments generate for us. But for Paul, those accomplishments are useless and trivial if they are done without love or if they have become a barrier to our ability to be loving. No matter how many possessions we have or how prominent a place in society we have attained, if we don't have love in this deeper sense, if we don't love the way God is calling us to love, is teaching us to love, 
and we are lost. And Paul says, as is good as dead. And if we take nothing else from this chapter, Paul wants us to know this. Love is a verb. And I'll repeat that because it is so simple and yet so important to understanding this passage. When Paul talks about the love that originates from God, he does not mean a static thing that can be objectified, held, contained, or even protected. We don't protect love. Love protects us. It is a living, breathing activity of building up. Love is a verb. And forgiveness is not possible without love. Because love doesn't keep score. Love always protects. Love bears all things. Love passes over all things in silence. And Paul says here that God's love looks the other way and doesn't return evil for evil. And when we think about our friendships, we know that they only last when we cut each other slack when we give each other the benefit of the doubt and we forgive them as much as possible, when they forgive us as much as possible and we each overlook slights and inconsiderations. So if our friendships depend on that, then so much more does love and our life partnerships. But we need to take note that in extreme circumstances, love does not pass in silence when there is a need to stand up and protect ourselves and others. Sometimes love does not allow us to look the other way. When someone is being abused or when injustice is allowed to continue. As Paul says, love is not happy with injustice. Instead, love is happy with the truth. In our nation, it has only been a recent development that people have been allowed to love and marry someone of a different identity. It's been within my lifetime that the U.S. Supreme Court, in the aptly named case of Loving versus the state of Virginia, unanimously struck down state laws banning marriage between individuals of different races based on the Due Process Clause and the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, and it has been less than 10 years since the Supreme Court ruled that the fundamental right to marry is also guaranteed to same-sex couples by those same clauses in the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. When the vulnerable are discriminated against by the powerful, love and justice work together to protect and defend the dignity of the victims, not the perpetrators. Love bears all things, but not when those things harm what God creates and what God loves. And God loves all people, regardless of their plumbing and with whom they choose to be in a committed and truly loving relationship. The central message of love in 1 Corinthians 13 is relevant to the importance of LGBTQIA inclusion and the call we have 
as Christians to defend the dignity of every human being. Love is love. Love transcends labels, identities, and orientations. Love and acceptance are at the heart of Jesus' teachings. Love should be at the center of our interactions, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity. And as we saw at the United Methodist General Conference meeting in Charlotte last month, when considering the question of LGBTQIA inclusion, we should approach it with patience, compassion, and empathy. Because over time, the will of God is shown. And rather than focusing on exclusion and judgment, if we follow the guidance of Paul here in 1 Corinthians 13, we can seek to understand and affirm the humanity and dignity of all people, regardless of orientation and identity. And while 1 Corinthians 6.9 and 1 Timothy 1.10 do mention certain sexual behaviors, it's important to approach these passages with nuance and historical critical analysis. The context in those passages refers to exploitive forms of same-sex behavior rather than committed loving relationships. And any exploitive form of relationship and sexual behavior goes against God's way of love as described in 1 Corinthians 13, regardless of whether the genders are the same or not. And Paul in this passage is revealing one of the great mysteries about the way that God loves. And it runs counter to the common sense way that we live in this world of being survival-focused and thinking that everything is a zero-sum game and we need to hustle and get ours. No, Paul says, God's way of love teaches us that in seeking the good of the other, we find our own good. We are taught, we are socialized to believe that we need to take care of ourselves first. And then if there's anything left over, well, then we can give that to others. But Paul argues that our good is not achievable apart from the well-being of others in the body of Christ to which we all belong. So there is a circularity to love. It starts with God's love of us that renews and restores us. And then it moves out toward others as a way of responding in thankfulness to God's love. In this way, love cannot be held. And it cannot be held back. It cannot be contained. It is love only when it is realized fully by being shared with someone else. So looking after the interests of others benefits all persons in the community and also benefits us as well. And that's why a community like this church, which seeks to be a loving community, puts so much emphasis on mission and reconciliation, of extending that love outward. But we have to also balance our care and love for others with our care and love for ourselves. Love never truly becomes love if it becomes an excuse to avoid proper self-care or cover up and hide proper self-assessment, and live in denial. And then this passage moves into something very 
interesting and profound. The analogy to which Paul describes about knowing and being known. And the inseparable relationship between love and knowledge. Paul says that God knows us perfectly. And the time will come when we will know ourselves as God knows us. God's knowing, like God's loving, precedes and gives power to our knowing and our loving. Our limited forms of knowing and loving can always be improved upon and grown through God's grace until we come to our end and can know and love as we have been known and loved. Mountains come and go, but love endures. Not only does our loving endure beyond us, but our loving is our enduring legacy as well. Again, our society teaches us that we can only leave behind a legacy through our wealth and accomplishments by having our name on a building or our name on books in the library. But in this chapter, Paul is challenging us to live our lives differently. He asks us, how would we steward our time, our energy, our resources, if our goal was to maximize an enduring legacy that was built up by love instead of money or titles? Ultimately, Paul says, love should be the guide for all of our understanding and interactions. As Lenny Kravitz sings, let love rule. As we navigate these discussions, let's do so with grace, empathy, and a commitment to affirming the humanity and dignity of all people. 1 Corinthians 13 reminds us that love is the essence of our faith. Whether it's love for God, love for others, or love for ourselves. It transcends boundaries and embraces all. Love never fails. Amen.
Now, in the name of the God who creates, the source of all existence, the God who reconciles us to God and to each other, the God who sustains us every day, go out this week into the world and expand that circle of love. Know and experience how you are loved by God. And then reach out and share that love with everyone you can. Amen. Thank you.